This has been a chaotic and emotionally wrenching week in America, and so we've been dedicating our television time to conversations with people who really understand what it's like to be black in America in 2020. Earlier today, I had a great talk with my very talented friend, Sam Richardson, so let's go to that now. Yeah. My guest tonight flew across the world last year to introduce me to the country of Ghana and its incredible people. He's a very talented comedian uh, who starred on the acclaimed HBO series Veep, as well as the comedy Central series Detroiters. And I'm so glad he's with me tonight. Please welcome our really good friend, Sam Richardson. Hey, Sam. Hey, Connor. Thanks very much. Uh, for being here. I know that you had expressed like a little bit of concern or maybe trepidation about coming on tonight. Is that true or? Well, yeah, because personally, you know, I, 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 I feel there's like people who are more eloquent at expressing kind of what's happening or, or better, you know, uh, figurehead for kind of the, the responsibility of kind of expressing what's going on right now. Right. Uh, but ultimately it came to the decision like, yes, like, well, you know, I am a black man in America, so I have empirical knowledge of the situation. Yep. Uh, and all I can do is speak for myself and you are my friend uh, and I appreciate your, uh, idea of like it, raising black voices to speak. So I figure this was a good opportunity to do that. Yeah, I, I think there there doesn't need to be, um, <clears throat> I, I know what you mean, because there are many times when all of us in different situations feel like inadequate. I'm constantly thinking, why am I talking, um, not just in this situation, but in a lot of situations. And then I think uh, this isn't just about people who are specialists in, right. Black history or Black history in America, uh, it's not just a, about them, it's about everybody who has something to say, who's experienced mm -hmm. firsthand what this is like. So how are you? How are you as a human being <laughs> right uh, now? <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's the question, right? Uh, every, every, every phone call, every meeting, everything will start with that. And it's like a really, you know, uh, double dutch <laughs> kind of, answer uh the fact of the matter i'm i'm incredibly sad um incredibly angry you know uh but but what's happening but but at the same time i'd say i'm not surprised and i think no black person in america is surprised or shocked by what's happening or what's happened we've known this whole time, I think what is, I don't even know if I want to use the word encouraging, but what is encouraging is watching the actual reaction to it, you know, thing that has been happening for ever, you know, but now is a time where it, there's a, a, a solid fight back. So that's, that is uh, an encouraging thing, but you know, I'm, 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 I'm perfectly, I'm, I'm sad all the time. I'm, I'm mad all the time. I'm filled with anxiety. And I watch, I, you know, I, I, I can't keep off my phone from seeing what's going on. Right. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I try and, and uh, just take care of myself. That's what, you know, that's what we need to do. Like, we can't, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, the, we, we, can't, we can't, I can't let myself get into full despair. I have to let myself get into action. Right. That makes sense. Right. It does make sense. Um, the, I'm curious because, you and I went uh, a year ago to Ghana. You showed me your country that, you're, uh, that, that your family is from. You have this really fascinating worldview because you come from two worlds. You know, mm -hmm. you spent time growing up in Ghana, but also Detroit. Mm -hmm. So, and, and so you have this perspective that is to me, absolutely unique, and and maybe we could learn from. Uh, well, yeah, it's true. Yeah, I, I grew up between two places. I grew up between Ghana and uh, Detroit, and like in Ghana, the faces are all black, so I have no fear of being uh, of prejudice for the color of my skin. There, you know, black people represent 
the wealthy elite, the middle class, and the lower class, you know, there. So, you know, that experience I have, and then to juxtapose that to my, my, my life in the United States, there, there is no bolder contrast to know that here, I mean, legitimately, it's second class citizen, you know? Have you talked to your mom? Does she have a take on what's happening right now? Uh, my mom is in Ghana right now, as a matter of fact, and, you know, uh, and she's been kind of like, like quarantined up and sequestered because of COVID and everything. And, mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the borders are, are closed there still. But she's just worried about my safety being here. You know, yeah. she's nervous and she's she's frightened. My, my dad is in Detroit right now. You know, same sentiments. Uh, the fear that kind of exists. And I'm not a parent, but the fear that exists for parents to to have your children navigate in the world where you know there is a threat to their lives and their livelihoods that uh, you know that's it. that's just this reality what, what can you tell me what your experience was uh, i mean I, i'll tell you one of them mm -hmm. uh i remember i remember i was at my girlfriend's house uh, if this was in, in, uh, Detroit suburbs, this was in, in Berkeley and it was late, late night, a drunk driver outside hit a pole, you know, uh, hit it, crashed it, uh, right next to my car. The police came investigating and I said, I went outside and I was like, oh, officers. And the guy screamed at me so quick, get the back, get the back and hand the gun. And I, I mean... Maybe in that instant, I had kind of forgotten what the protocol is for black people dealing with police, you know? Because I was like trying to help, I was trying to help, like curious to see what was going on with my car that was right next to this thing. And as if there was a, uh, as, as if there, there was like a bank robbery happening, you came here for a drunk driver. Yeah, yeah. And a bystander, what did you think my plan was? <laughs> I, and I remember I, I, call, I called my dad. I had nothing. To, I, I didn't know what else to do. You know, I was just like, empty. I called my dad. And he's like, yeah, remember. And he said, he said, remember. Mm. I remember, I mean, another time, another time. Uh, I, was, I was much younger. Um, I went into a, a sport, sporting goods store, uh, sports authority. And I was walking through the aisles and kind of just like looking around, perusing. Uh, I went to walk out of the sports authority and this woman grabs me and yanks me into this room. Like, I know what you did. I know what you did. The cops are coming. The cops are coming. I know what you did. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the police showed up and they're like, we know that you stole something. And I just couldn't, I, <laughs> I, 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 I was just fully confused. You know, I'm like 12 years old. Um, you know, and yeah. I, 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 it's this threat, but this, this woman like was like, oh, I can, I, this, 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 this boy must have stole something and I have the proof of it and I'm going to directly get it out of him. The police come and they're uh, as aggressive. They check the footage of me in the, on the aisleway and I had taken off my watch to put on a baseball glove and put my watch in my pocket. And the response, as though I had committed an armed robbery. Yeah, yeah. And she knew that calling the police was going to elicit that sort of response. Like, like knew that I had no quarter. And so you're, she, 12, you're 12, you're 12 years 12 old. 12 years old. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, how do you contain that anger do you know what i'm saying how do you because right because i you don't um this is from my perspective but you know in all the time we spent together uh it's hard for me to imagine you containing those infuriating humiliating experiences do you know what i mean and so now in this yeah, moment it can sure. come out but where do you, uh, what do you do with that? How do you live in the world with that kind of anger? I mean, we all, we, we all have to, you know what I mean? If, if we were all to show the, the amount of 
of, of frustration and fear that we feel we, you know, we wouldn't be able to exist in society. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, to make it, to make it nerd <laughs> uh, in the movie Avengers, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Captain, like they're, they're, they're surrounded by the, the, the villains, the, the, the aliens are attacking. Captain America's like, Hulk, now'd be a good time to get angry. And, and Hulk looks at him and says, that's my secret captain. I'm always angry. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm always angry. Yeah. You know, but I'm also, I, I, I can't let that anger make me, I can't let that anger dictate my life and stop me from experiencing life. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we, that's, that's true for all of us. There's no way that we, we can see what happens in the world and, and watch these cases of violence against us and not be angry, you know? Uh, and these things boil over. You know, what we're watching right now, these things boiling over. You know, I've been talking this week, uh, trying to look for, um, trying to listen and also trying to figure out uh, how can this not be just another incident that we all process, there's unrest, and then we move on, mm-hmm. find ourselves back in the same situation six months from now, two years from now. What, what's the way forward? And one of the things that uh, W. Kamel Bell told me yesterday was he said, it's action, let's see your work. Let's yes. see your work. And I thought that really spoke to me, which is, um, yes, there's a lot of talk right now and talk is good. And there are a lot of people um, trying to symbolically, and I'm, I'm talking about white people trying to show that they care, but then so much more about, it, it, it feels like right now is about what are you going to do? What are people going to do moving forward? What is your work? And you got to keep at it. Meaning we, uh, there's a lot, there's clearly a lot of work here to be done. Yes. So I, I don't know if, if that's. Well, I, f- I think right now there's a, there's like a, a sweet spot, right? Cause everybody's at home with COVID, everybody's closed in and are faced with it. They have to see what's happening. And there's not like immediately after a distraction, because you know, you like, like, and go to go to work and then like, kind of like forget about what's happening. If you're, you're, you're bombarded with it every day, you see what's happening, you see what's happening. It's impossible to ignore right now. So it's, and, and how about that? That shows that th- these things aren't new but you can watch like now everybody's watching and you just see how close together they are and how, that's constant it, it, these things didn't just start when everybody was at home watching their phones and that but they're they're constant so now everybody is is forced to act you know so like moving forward it has to be everybody has to remember how they feel right now you know, everybody has to act right now and do as much as they can. People, we want to be distracted as much as we can because we want to keep our world the same way it is because we're comfortable in it. But right now, people are uncomfortable and they have to remember that discomfort. You know, it was, it was, it's called the pain for change. You know, how much uh, stress or how much pain can you put on a situation before you have to change it? You know, in order to, 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 to it, it, you can't, like if somebody's pinching you, you know, a person who gets pinched, the second this pinch doesn't mean anything. So you, you don't move. And somebody pinches harder, you don't do this. Somebody pinches hard, you say, ah, stop it. You know, you have, then you change your circumstances. Mm-hmm. So right now we have to remember this pain before all the other distractions of the world come in, you know? And we're watching, we're watching things are happening. You know, all four officers have been charged. And, you know, uh, the Breonna Taylor, Taylor case has been reopened. We're watching, we're watching these, these things happen. And if we keep on it, we can affect real change. 
And that's another thing too, like it's up to white people and all people to educate themselves, educate themselves. The knee jerk reaction of when somebody says black lives matter to then say all lives matter, whether you are well-intentioned or actively trying to discredit the idea of black lives matter, pay attention to what that is. You know what, like, what is it that makes you say that? Do you really believe that when a person says black lives matter, we're saying black lives matter more? Or is it that the idea of changing the system frightens you, you know? I mean, these are the questions you, get, you got asked. Like, I, there's nothing more frustrating, truly, than going through your comments or they're going through my comments and I say something Black Lives Matter, and say, well, all lives matter. Yeah. Like, hey, don't you think we know that? Nobody said all lives don't matter. Not once did I say a white life doesn't matter. Not once did I say an Asian life doesn't matter. All I said is a Black life matters. Right. Matters. Like, was, was it Michael Che uh, in the stand-up was like, all, we first start out at matters. That's the lowest... Uh, uh, talking point, and if, to, to see a, a, a opposition to that is uh, is frustrating. Yeah, there's also I think a um, there's a fear of uh, people want to, and again I'm going to be specific. Uh, white Americans uh, want to do things that will help or make a difference or sound like, uh, or be supportive, and they might get it wrong. Yes. And then they might get checked for it. They may uh, put up the, uh, like with the internet, uh, you know, people putting up the, the black tiles, black tiles, thinking that, and, and it's well-intentioned, mm -hmm. but then it turns out to uh, actually not be helping and angering some people and then there's a feeling of, well, wait, I just touched the stove. I thought I was helping and I got burned. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've been learning this week is, yeah, be, be wrong, try, just keep trying. And um, being embarrassed or saying, okay, my bad. I thought this was the right thing to do. It's not, now I'm going to try again. Yes. But my embarrassment uh, is a tiny, tiny, tiny price to pay. It's yeah. less than a mosquito bite. You know, this idea that some that people are going to try something, get checked for it online, and then get angry and say, well, I tried. Shut off. I, I put up a black tile, and now it turns out I'm not supposed to do that, so I'm out. Right. I'm going to watch uh, Real Housewives. Because <laughs> I tried to help, and that's that. Well, they don't want my help, so that's that. I'm done. Yeah. You know, yeah. in what education do you go in knowing everything about it? What person goes into college knowing everything about the college courses? This is a time where people are trying to learn and people need to learn. Right. So part of learning is getting things wrong and then checking yourself and then applying that to the next time. You know, I think people, I would always say like people can't let their fear of getting things wrong or fear of not being able to do the perfect thing or getting things perfectly right, stop them from trying to do something. Yes. You know, those right. are the steps that you have to take. You have to, Get out there and, and, and just make the first step at least. And then let that encourage you to see, oh, okay, I can do something and then do the next step. And then do something and then do the next step. You know, like, but you, you, people need to, 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 to get the idea out of their head. They need to just go straight into being Martin Luther King or Malcolm X and like just from zero to a hundred. That's, that's, that's not rational, but you need to do something and then learn from it and grow from it the growth, we have to grow in this. Mm -hmm. You know, to back up, you you took me to Ghana for us to do a, a special about the year of the return, the 400 years uh, uh, since uh, first slave ships were leaving, uh, you know, Africa. And we went to Ghana to experience that moment. And we ran into this group of people from the Chicago, uh, I think it's Trinity United Church. And they were all from Chicago and they were visiting to experience this moment. And I think it was Kumasi. Kumasi, yeah. Yeah. And 
I started talking to them and it was beautiful. They were so fantastic and so moving to speak to that I wanna make sure we show that clip because this is from a year ago, but I think it resonates now um, probably more than it did then. Why is it important for you to be here? You know, it's a time to remember those who came before us and our mm -hmm. ancestors. Um, it's just really deep to see those who resisted that's a major thing they bring up those who were resistors, who fought back, um, and a lot of people did not make it. So many people died on this journey um, to be stripped and taken from their home. Right. It's kind of an awakening. We've only been free for roughly 160 years, whereas we've been in bondage for over 400 years. Mm -hmm. So physically, yes, we're free. Mentally, not so much. Yeah. Um, for me personally, um, I'm realizing how much racial stress I'm under every day in America. I don't even realize it. Um, I don't even realize that when I walk into spaces where I am a minority, I am constantly checking myself. Here, I don't feel that. When I am here, I feel that I am at home. One thing that is striking is 400 years of slavery. Think about it. 400 years. How many generations of people, good people, that sat on the sidelines and watched slavery occur? This is a lesson that we all need to learn is that if we see injustice, whether it's happening to us personally or ha happening to our neighbors, we got to find a way to speak out and stand up. The one thing that's on my mind was with a guard, uh, one of the guys that when we went back to one of the slave auction castles, he said that you can either be bitter, which means you can leave here weak, or you can either be better, which means you will leave here stronger. And so I thought about what that meant. And what that meant is that we've seen much agony and we've seen much pain, but we've also seen much hope and much promise and much glory. So we must tell the whole story, but let us put as much emphasis on the hope and on the glory and on the optimism as we tell the story so that people can say, well, there is a brighter day. You know how eloquent and how smart and on target everybody was in that circle everybody had a, a, a it was absurd it was absurd yeah. a random group of i don't know if it was 20 or 25 uh people i i'd be hard pressed to go anywhere in the world and and grab 25 people and ask them all their opinion and not one of them <laughs> one of them was anything less than than just beautifully eloquent and powerful and <laughs> is there a teleprompter? <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they know coming. Where is the prompter? <laughs> Absolutely, uh, such a beautiful moment. And, uh, and, and then, but you see, you, you, you. There's, there's a uh, every, every well, uh, hard to say every, but black people, we experience the world, and we must be knowledgeable of it. You know, and so the you caught. 25 people who are in a journey for knowledge. Mm -hmm. So every one of them has been thinking and, and expressing their ideas so specifically and, and cultivating what their feelings are. And so you caught them at the perfect time because as a black person, you have to be a scholar in order to understand your feelings of what's, right. ha what, what, what hap what's, what's happened to you and what's happened to people in this country for 400 years, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, it's hard to ignore, you know? So, so like those 25 people, you, you, you caught a uh, sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is, like I say, it's, it's almost like a, um, it, it must be endlessly frustrating to have because I've been I'm, this week, I've been talking to whether it's Van Jones or W. Camel Bell or you, th that that this incident happens, and then suddenly everyone's asking you, "How do you feel?" and educate me, which is exhausting and not your job. It's not your job to educate us; it's our job to educate ourselves. Yes. And um, you know, and I'm I'm just yes. uh, you know, if everyone I've spoken to this week, you're the one I know the best. And it's, it's upsetting to hear your stories. Uh, and, and because I know you to be such an amazingly sweet and sensitive person. And uh, I hate that 
12 year old or 20 year old you or 30 year old you had to go through any of that i just it it's makes me uh it makes me nauseous to be honest yeah. so that same uh so so you know me uh and it, it, this this is just like a, a grander lesson for anybody who's watching or anything if you know me and you know that i have this experience imagine that for every black person that you know yeah. You know, whether you know them better than me or you know them less than me, you know them to be a human being and they've experienced this. If that doesn't call you to action, then you got to call, you got to ask yourself what would, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. Uh, you know, for someone who was worried about, you know, Earlier, you were telling me, well, I'm worried about, I was had some trepidation about coming on the show because all these professional speakers on racial strife and, and, uh, and scholars have been talking, and I don't know what my place is. And uh, your, your fears were not, were not uh, valid because <laughs> everything you've, you've just talked about your experience and it's as powerful as anything I've heard this week. So, you know, I really do appreciate it. Um, it's, uh, and I'm hoping, it, I would like, I would like to be optimistic. I don't know if you are, but I would like to have, I always describe myself as a 51% optimist. I'm, right. I'm aware, I'm pessimistic, but I'm, I'm, I wanna slightly lean towards optimism and I wanna hope that this gets us to a better place if we keep doing the work. I think so. I think we have to keep doing the work. I think like going back, like, you know, uh, there's no quick fix to anything. You know, like uh, 2008, we elected Barack Obama and everybody patted themselves on the back. We're like, yes, we did it. We fixed racism. We no. got him. That's done. On to the next case. And we were done with it, you know. And then nobody went to vote two years later. Nobody went to do it. Yeah. So then, like, like we need to educate ourselves on how the government works. That so you don't put this all on one person. You have to work the system. Yeah. And if, the more we educate ourselves, the more we can see. Like, and there's hope out there. We have to vote. You know, we have to become a part of this. Like, uh, and 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 we can see we can change things. It was uh, like the first black woman mayor was just elected in Ferguson. Mm -hmm. You know, just happened. We can make change happen. We have to, we just have to do it. Right. Uh, and we can't be discouraged by voting. Like, like, and yes, voter suppression is real. You know, uh, gerrymandering of districts is real. These things are real. But with overwhelming numbers, you can't deny them. You know, and you say like, you, you, you talk about uh, getting discouraged, you know, like, can't get discouraged. Black people have been going through this for 400 years here. We haven't been discouraged yet. So, you know, I say well, my white friends, y'all yeah, can't either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm discouraged. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> that sounds pretty lame. I'm discouraged. Like, well. <laughs> <laughs> Sam has to cheer Conan up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Dumbest segment of the week. <laughs> Sam, uh, you're a really good friend and a great human being. And thank you very much for, uh, for sharing with me and um, for making, uh, I'll tell you this, I feel, uh, I feel better. Not that that's the goal, but I do. Just uh, um, having you in my life. And I really appreciate you talking to me. Well, I appreciate your friendship. And I appreciate you using this time to elevate, elevate. I appreciate, I'm gonna, think, I'm gonna say that one more time. I appreciate your friendship. <laughs> and I, this is what I was worried about. This is what I was worried about. There it is, <laughs> right at the end, tripped up at the finish line. I, <laughs> so well, and you couldn't, I think subconsciously, you were like, you know what, Conan's an ass, I can't. <laughs> I can't, I almost put on a professor's uh, <laughs> and a monocle and it was like, and my point is made. And then just dumped it into the river. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> but uh, I do appreciate you elevating black voices. Well, uh, let's, let's keep it going. Uh,
let's let's keep it going and uh um let's uh you know again thank you so much and i just keep thinking about my favorite moment i know this is so silly to bring up at the end but in ghana visiting your mom at her house seeing all this really cool stuff uh you know the moment i'm talking about <laughs> tribal emblems pictures of chieftains that you're related to proud warrior stuff just amazing and then going down and suddenly <laughs> A bobblehead, a Funko doll, Funko of, Pop. a Funko Pop doll of your character from Veep is between all the. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I remember that moment, just thinking like, "This is so great. This is our son has gone off and he's conquered America. <laughs> this is what he's done." That's right. That's a great moment for me. Uh, all right, you take care, and I'll see you very soon. All right. All right. Take, take care. care.